All right, welcome back, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us, joining us as we reboot the Arctos webinar series this fall. Hopefully, everyone had a good summer break. Um, today, I'm joined by Teresa Mayfield Mayer from the Museum of Southwestern Biology, and we'll be talking about collection metrics and data quality improvement tools available in Arctos. This is a recap of a talk we presented at the Spinach meeting back in May as part of a symposium on collecting measures of success in natural history museums. Um, but this time around, we'll be able to demonstrate Arctos metric tools in real time and go into a little bit more detail. Um, but before I begin, I want to point out some Arctos resources, including our website and handbook, and a link to previous webinar recordings. Um, you'll see these links up in the right-hand corner of your screen throughout the presentation. Um, be sure to save the date also for our um, webinar next month with Erin Gunderson on using publications and projects to demonstrate a collection's impact. This presentation will build on a previous webinar on publications and projects by taking a deeper dive into some examples and providing step-by-step -step demonstration of tools. As, <coughs> excuse me, as always, please feel free to ask questions in the chat box throughout our presentation, and we'll also leave time for questions at the end. Um, at which point I'll also remind you to please fill out a quick IDIG bio survey um, on the presentation so we can solicit your feedback. Um, but with that, let's go ahead and get started with Teresa. Okay. Hello, everybody. Get my sh shared here and we'll get started. So um, first, I would like to talk a bit about metrics dashboards. And hopefully, everyone has seen um, some dashboards that are pretty. Um, I will show you one here from Jeeva. Um, they provide this for all collections that are um, in Jeeva. And it's kind of nice with graphs and charts and interesting information that looks really pretty and um, could potentially be screenshotted and used in a report. Um, in Arctos, we have a lot of this same information, but we just usually don't present it in such a nice format. So our main dashboard is known as System Stats. This is uh, kind of some screenshots from System Stats in Arctos. And it does provide a lot of interesting information, but often the information is meaningless if you don't do a little comparison or visualization. So, um, for instance, if you look at the MSB bird collection here with its 18 GenBank links, um, if that's compared to 44,000 cataloged items, um, it might be good or bad to have just 18. It depends on what those cataloged items are. So it still requires some looking at and working through to make these useful. So just as a demonstration to show you how you can get into system stats in Arctos, um, you have to be logged in um, and be an operator in order to see the system stats. But you find that in Reports and Services, View Statistics, and then, oops, System Stats. Um, when you get to this page, the first thing you see is a filter. If you scroll down, you actually see the stats. So there's Global, which is every collection in Arctos, which is interesting, but probably doesn't serve a purpose for most collection managers. And then there's the detail by collection in Arctos. Um, one drawback of this screen is that as you scroll down, you lose the column headers. You can hover over a number to understand what that means. But most likely, what you're going to want to do is to filter for whichever collection you're interested in so that you can see just that. It makes it a lot nicer. So um, system stats is great. For some of those items, we have more detailed reports. So for instance, um, the georeference report. Um, these more detailed reports are usually a little better at getting down to some actual stats, like percentage of specimens georeferenced, um, 
and percentage georeference, including an error. But again, it lacks visualization, no charts or graphs, it's just the, the data. Um, to get to these reports, it's in the same spots. Oops. I know I've been logged out. We go. So again, for these, you have to be logged in, and they're going to be in stats. And for this one, it's georeference stats. So you can see in this menu here, there are some other reports. I'm not going to go into all of them in this webinar, um, but each of them usually contains some sort of information about what's in this report, um, some caveats, things that might appear strange in the report, depending on uh, what you expect and what you might actually see, um, and explanations of the columns. And then when you get down to the bottom, you get the actual report. So this one, unlike the other, um, you, you scroll down and lose your column headers, and when you hover over the numbers, you don't really get much information. So this one's a little more difficult to use. Um, you can download it, though, and then just pull out the collections that you're interested in, which is probably what you would end up doing anyway so that you can create some visualizations to go along with it. So that's an example of one of the drill down reports. And I think we're going to turn it over back over to Emily. All right, let me share my screen here. All right, so um, here are some examples of specimen metric visualizations currently available in Arctos. They're public-facing tools, so you don't have to be an Arctos operator to access them. And like the main specimen search function, these tools can perform powerful queries, um, but rather than returning individual specimen records, they're compiling collections data in table, chart, or map formats so that holdings can be quickly summarized and visualized. Um, so let's briefly just take a look at these individually. So if I go to my um, Arctos specimen search page, um, the first tool we'll look at is the specimen summary search, which provides collection statistics in a table format. Um, so for example, if I want to know how many herp specimens we have here in the CU collection from Chiapas, I can select um, my herp collection, and I'll scroll down to this locality area, and I will specify um, Chiapas, and then um, scroll up, and I'll see my results as, um, instead of specimen records, I'll select specimen summary, and then I can um, click all the parameters I want to see, and in this case I'll just click um, family and scientific name, um, but you can see there are other options, and I'll click on search. Um, so I use this feature to get a broad sense of what we have in the collection. Um, I tend to um, use this for um, annual reports um, and also just grant writing. Um, so you can see here in the results I have um, over 1,200 specimens grouped into 158 unique names and I can sort this list um, you know, to see our best represented species you know, or by family um, and then I can actually click on the specimen link to view the associated uh, specimen records and sort of tunnel down further. Uh, let me back out of this, and um, now we can look at take a look at graphs. Um, and as with the specimen summary feature, we can summarize collections holdings, but we can also start to get into things like agent activity through this feature. So for instance, um, let me look up a prominent collector for our collection, um, Paul Ma Maslin. And I'll <coughs> scroll back up and hit graph. Um, and then I can specify what type of chart I want to see. So I'll just leave the default 3D pie graph, um, and I'll select by country. And um, this will give me a pie chart of Paul Maslin's um, collecting activity by country. Um, so you can see here he's got sort of global activity, but um, with emphasis in US and Mexico. 
um, I can go back and sort of do this search maybe with a different uh, type of graph. Maybe let's look at his specimens collected by year and I'll order that by the parameter so that I get my years in the proper order. Um, and this way I can look at what um, this collector has done um, by year, which is kind of an interesting um, thing to look at. So um, yeah, graphs can be uh, interesting to play around with. And of course, you get a lot more, um, you can get a lot more complex with your queries and really drill down into multi-parameter searches. Um, you'll notice these aren't the sleekest graphics, um, but they are very easy to really uh, quickly copy and paste into an annual report or just visualize holdings without having to scroll down through a large table um, or download your specimen records and create your own charts. Um, and one last visualization tool I'll show you um, is the Berkeley Mapper feature. Um, so again, let's do another search for herps. Um, this time we'll broaden and go to Mexico. I'll click on um, see results as Berkeley Mapper map and search. And um, while this is cranking, I'll just mention that uh, you can also see mapped records when performing a regular search, um, specimen search via Google Maps. But the Berkeley Mapper feature is nice because it can plot large volumes of coordinates um, versus the search results display points um, for the first thousand localities. Um, so here, you know, specimen records are plotted and, and sort of binned by the quantity um, of specimen records per area. So by clicking on each cluster, I can call up the corresponding specimen records. Um, let me bring this up. And then um, from there, I can go ahead and click on the catalog number I'd like to navigate to. So some challenges with these tools are that they don't illustrate curatorial activity metrics, such as number of loans or accessions, um, despite that information being readily available. So there's a lot more that could be done in terms of data visualization. Um, these metrics are query-based, and they're static in some cases and not dynamically linked with specimen records, as we saw with the graphs. Um, and they're kind of dispersed and scattered throughout Arctos. Um, so they're not all in one place, pre-generated and awaiting exploration. Um, so our wish list would really be to um, create a dashboard that pulls all of these tools into a centralized location. Um, and we envision something like this. Uh, using dedicated dashboard software to produce dynamic visualizations that are intuitive and can be filtered. Um, this particular example on the slide uses Tableau with a data set from UCM collections. Um, Tableau is easy to work with and um, very easy to explore data. Um, so on the to-do list is really um, investigating other possible dashboard software with embeddable APIs that would plug into Arctos. Um, and we're open to suggestions if anyone has experience with dashboard software and has any recommendations. Uh, but essentially, we're wanting to integrate dashboards that cater to various stakeholders in meaningful ways. So for instance, um, global overview statistics for administrators or more sophisticated query metrics for researchers and educators, um, and then several collections-facing dashboards that summarize curatorial activity and data use statistics. Um, which could run things like gap analytics to improve our data quality. Um, next, we have a couple of unique dashboards that depart from purely specimen-based metrics. So I'm using the term dashboard in a loose sense. Um, as, the as the next examples aren't really um, visualization tools per se, but they do represent user interfaces that provide at-a-glance summaries of database activity. Um, so the first is agent activity, and here's a consolidated view of the agent activity page. Um, this page provides a total view of research as well as curatorial contributions by people and institutions with dynamic links to the relevant data. So you can see it summarizes things like agent collections, publications author authored, database entries. Um, so it can really facilitate attribution as well as assessment metrics by capturing agent effort. Um, so let's look at this page in Arctos. Um, and I've already queried Joseph Grinnell um, in the agent table. And here is his agent profile. So if I click on the view agent activity report, it will take me to that agent activity page. And this 
page contains that same information you just saw on the slide, just formatted a bit differently. Um, but I do want to mention that in order to create the agent activity page, standardized data are essential. So in the Arctos model, all names and aliases are resolved under one preferred name, um, which allows us to have a unique agent with no duplicate name iterations across all Arctos institutions. So, um, so you can see here all the variants of Grinnell's name, which are resolved under his preferred name, Joseph Grinnell. Um, and because there is only one in, um, one and only one Joseph Grinnell, this allows us precision when trying to fully connect him with all of his activities and contributions over the course of his career. So if we scroll down, um, we can see all of his familial relationships, um, also academic relationships. We can see um, links to Wikidata for biography uh, information. And um, just to note, for contemporary agents, an ORCID ID can be entered into the agent profile that acts as a unique identifier similar to a DOI um, for people, and that links them with their research contributions. Um, we can also see what Joseph Grinnell has collected or prepared with links out to the specific um, specimen records. Um, any media created by or um, referencing him, projects he's been involved with, um, as well as his publications, which I'll scroll quickly through because there are many. Um, but again, those do link out to publication records um, containing cited specimens. Um, there we go. And then at the bottom here, we'll see um, all of the curatorial actions and, and transactions, like um, number of records entered or edited, um, identifications he's provided, um, loan or accession transactions. And obviously, Grinnell uh, doesn't have much in the way of curatorial activity, given he's a historic agent, so he's not actively working in the database. But this is a useful feature for staff and students to document how many records they entered or georeferenced or transactions they've processed, so they can add that to a resume um, or annual report. Um, and again, this agent dashboard is public facing um, and, and openly accessible, but we do uh, ultimately hope to create a more explorable, explorable format in the future. And I think we're back to Teresa. Oops. Um, actually, it's just a taxon page, um, but it does the same thing as the agent page does, summarizing all of the activities around a given taxon within Arctos and then linking out to resources about that taxon outside of Arctos. So this is also a public facing page, and um, to get to it, from the main search menu, you search taxonomy, and then you enter the name that you're interested in. So we are going to try this. And you can see when you enter a genus or part of a name, you'll get a list of names that include whatever text you entered. So you can scroll through the text to, uh, through the list, sorry, to whichever one interests you. And the one that I had on my slide is right here. And so these pages um, capture a map of the taxon's representation in Arctos. So we can see where these where specimens of this taxon were collected. Sorry about that. There are links to media that are associated with this taxon. Um, and that includes media that's attached to specimens that are identified with the taxon. A link to related names. So in this case, there's potential alternate spellings. There can be synonyms. Um, also in the related taxa section, and the blue texts are hot links, so you can, if 
we click this link, it'll take us to that taxon page. A list of common names that have been entered into Arctos, depending on who worked on the taxon. Um, links within Arctos, so if you want to see all the specimens currently identified with this taxon name, uh, this link will take you there, and then you can get the Berkeley mapper um, like Emily showed earlier. Then at the bottom we have classifications. So these are all the classifications from global names um, as well as Arctos. So the first two, um, the Arctos classification, that's what's in use within Arctos. The Arctos legal is um, comes from C Species Plus um, and is useful to tell you if the taxon has legal restriction under CITES. It's very helpful when um, loaning things internationally. And then there's links to all the other global names um, classifications here as well. So this is a nice page for um, summarizing any given taxon. So now we're going to move on, and I'm going to um, ask everyone a poll question. Um, and you can use your little raise your hand icon on the um, Adobe Connect screen um, to let me know if you've heard of the extended specimen concept. And actually, Emily's going to have to check this for me. So we'll see if it looks like everybody's heard of it or not. See, I'm seeing lots of agrees come in. Oh, oh yay. Five, Everybody's well, yay. <laughs> At least half. <laughs> excellent, excellent. So um, when we were preparing our presentation for spinach, um, right about that time is when the Beacon paper, Extending U.S. Biodiversity Collections to Promote Research and Education, came out. Um, and I can put the... Uh, the link to the text in the chat here later, but um, it just seemed to mesh really well with what we were doing with our collection metrics. And as we kept talking about it, we sort of realized that um, extended specimens are what we are trying to create in Arctos. Um, this report calls for um, the extended specimen network a global network of extended specimens that capitalize on the depth and breadth of biodiversity held and digitally accessible in U.S. collections. So it also states that the concept of the extended specimen elevates and expands the physical specimen with an augmented digitized specimen record by associ associating genotypic, phenotypic, and environmental data types. And after reading it, we got to talking about what is success. Um, these metrics that we're presenting um, are meant to demonstrate success of some sort. And um, we feel like that's what we're trying to do in Arctos. Um, so let's talk about how we define success in Arctos. Right from the website, we, Arctos uh, mentions success as capturing the most complete representation of all that is known about or derived from a collection object and using standardized data to quantify its impact. So it looks like we've always strived to create deeply linked specimen data wherever possible to help us capture the most complete representation of knowledge about any specimen. So the specimen page demonstrates our efforts and um, it's really hard to see here, so I'm going to take you to this page. Um, but you can see that all of these blue text items are links to other data, both within and outside of Arctos. Specimen records that are deeply linked and capture all that is known about or derived from an object have been dubbed Arctos Gold Standard Records. So this specimen here is one of the Arctos gold standard records. And um, I'll kind of show you why. So this specimen 
has been identified multiple times by many people in many different ways. You can see all the identifications listed here. And many of these are supported by a citation. So it's also been cited in lots of publications. In addition, many of these identifications and publications are related to um, records in GenBank. So here we have these external links to GenBank records, which um, clicking on when any one of them will take you directly to the GenBank page um, so that you can see what went on there. And on the GenBank page, there is also a reciprocal link here that will take you right back to the record. So in addition to these GenBank links, we have uh, field notes and catalogs. So textual information that's been scanned in as media um, that you can visit directly from the specimen page. And um, this one isn't tagged, but these field notes can also be tagged with um, details about where the specimen exactly is mentioned. So that's really nice. There's also an image here taken of the specimen, which you can link to and see in more detail. There's trait information, standard mammal measurements given here. Um, who took the measurements and when is usually in there as well. Um, and then, of course, there's the standard date and place of collection here and the collectors and preparators at the top. So you can see from this specimen record that um, we see the Arctos Gold Standard as almost equivalent to the definition of an extended specimen. So how do we know if we're being successful in the way we've defined success in Arctos? We have something called the low quality data dashboard. And as Emily and I were working on this, um, we started calling it the unmetrics. As we try to achieve the most complete specimen representation possible, we end up with unmetrics, so information that's missing. To help complete each record, we have some low quality data reports that are summarized in a dashboard. These reports include citations when nothing has been loaned, unlinked data in GenBank, GenBank citations with no loan, overdue loans, unreviewed annotations, part disposition anomalies, and identifications that are not associated with a taxonomic classification. So with this dashboard, um, we know there's some data to improve. Um, what do you do next? Let's go take a look at the actual low quality data dashboard. So to get to the low quality data dashboard, you have to be um, signed in as an operator and you're going to go to reports and services, find low quality data and dashboard. So the dashboard, this particular dashboard will only present items that are related to collections to which you have access and the links provided generally present a list of the items that need attention, whether it's specimens, taxa, or localities. Um, some require copying um, an SQL um, program and using it in the right SQL tool um, to get to the problem items. And some don't have reports, um, but you just have to do your own search from the main page. So this is a great place to start a data, a data cleanup or to monitor activity in a collection. Um, using the tool links and doing a bit of research can help you bring these unmetrics to zero 
or to a list of known unfixable issues. Um, anybody who's using Arctos, we really encourage you to check out your low quality specimen data here at least once a year, um, more often if you have time. Um, but in addition to this dashboard, there's other tools scattered about that can improve data quality for everyone using Arctos where data is shared, so agents and taxonomy generally. So the standardized data or shared data and metrics um, that I'm going to talk about today are agents and, and taxonomy. These two I'll say tables, um, but sets of information are shared amongst all Arctos collections. Um, duplicate agents, um, spelling variants, etc., make it difficult to find everything collected or prepared by a given individual. The duplicate agent discovery tools can assist with finding and eliminating duplicates and allow agent names that are found to be duplicates to be merged. So to get to this tool, You go to Reports and Services, Find Low Quality Data, Duplicate Agents. From here, you can search for duplicates in a number of ways. When duplicates are discovered, you can complete a request to merge them, and they will be merged automatically if there are no objections for the community. Um, so you can see at the bottom, these are the different um, search possibilities that you can use to look for duplicates. Occasionally as you're working you may just come across duplicates and what we do there is um, pick the one that has the least amount of information or that is potentially incorrect, sometimes there's incorrect spellings, um, and mark that agent as bad duplicate of the correct agent. And then what happens is an email is generated to the Arctos community um, so that if somebody has a really good reason that, wait a minute, these two people are not the same, um, they can mark the bad duplicate of as not the same as, and that way everybody will understand from that point forward that these are indeed two different people. So, some tools are meant to help stop low quality data from being entered in the first place, and the taxon name validator is one of them. Let me go back here so you can kind of see what it looks like here. The taxon name validator queries various web services such as GBIF, Catalog of Life, Worms, etc., for names. The validator is not perfect, but it can help discover misspellings and outdated names before they get entered into Arctos. False positives and false negatives occur. Um, for instance, um, a name in this validation, which does not appear in any service, but still gets a might be valid um, because it's formatted appropriately. So any name that does not appear in any of the services deserves extra scrutiny. This is never expected to be the only source of a taxon name or classification validation, but just a place to start. So to get to this tool, you will go to Reports and Services, Data Services, and Taxon Name Validator. So for this tool, you have to create a CSV file, one column with the header taxon name, and a list of the names that you want to validate. It returns a CSV, like the one here on the slide, that allows the user to decide if they should add the name to Arctos or do a bit more research. Browsing the low-quality data and data services menus will let you explore other possibilities for improving data in Arctos or creating better data from the point of entry. So always be aware of these options here, the data services and find low-quality data. They're really great places to um, help improve your data quality. And now we're going to go back to Emily. All right, let me share my screen again. All right, so um, 
So the low quality uh, data dashboard also features an annotation tool where users can receive crowdsource feedback on any aspect of the specimen record, as well as automated annotations, um, typically re relating to bad georeferences. Um, so someone is viewing your data and wants to communicate with the collection regarding a particular record. Um, for instance, we'll go to this egg record. They can always um, click on this comment or report bad data button, uh, which brings up a simple free text form where they leave an annotation about anything. It can be, I don't think this collector was at this place on this day, or this name is misspelled. Um, and this will be emailed to the collection contact, but it will also be um, added to your dashboard. Um, and users can also uh, view previous annotations um, in the record. So in this case, there's a note on the georeference, um, which if I pull this over, you can see um, this point is mapping to somewhere in Russia versus um, where it is um, supposed to be um, in Alaska where the egg was originally collected. So um, again, I can view the uh, annotation on the low quality dashboard. Um, so if I just go to you know navigate to find low quality data dashboard, this is uh, my dashboard for my collection. Um, you can see there's quite a few unreviewed um, annotations. But if I click on this, um, and I have it open in different tabs since it takes a little while to churn, um, it's going to show me um, sort of all of the um, annotations related to the egg collection. Um, and the vast majority of these are automated. Um, I can see they're from our, our programmer, Dusty. Um, and that's because he's running a scheduled script. So the script, um, I'll kind of show here, it's kind of a visualization of what this looks like. Um, the script provides automated error detection for points that fall outside of the expected boundaries um, of, w, of higher geography WKT shapes. So these outliers then just um, get packaged into an annotation um, on the dashboard where users can then methodically review and track the errors um, and imply fixes as needed. Um, and in this case, I'd then just make a note in this um, review comment section um, that I've reviewed. Uh, the annotation, I've either um, left it as is or uh, I've, I've applied a fix. Um, and that way, we can just keep track of what annotations have been reviewed. Um, so loan metrics um, include capabilities such as finding all overdue loans, citation statistics, and mapping shipments. Uh, so the low quality dashboard supplies us uh, with potential misconnections. So you can see in this example, notifications for bird specimen records with no documented loan transaction, but yet which have links to publications and GenBank numbers. Um, there's also ways to query uh, specimen list loans or those without corresponding publications. Um, and these, these queries can also be found on the low quality data dashboard. So if I come back to my dashboard, you'll see here 12 bird specimens have citations without a loan history. I can click on these guys, um, and that's going to provide a list of the specimens. And you can see, um, you know, if you have multiple collections, you can also query um, different collections to call up uh, problematic records. Um, and I can also find them um, by navigating to reports and services um, and going to this publication slash loan slash project slash citation problems uh, feature. And uh, this way, I can also look at um, loans without specimens or projects with loans without publications. And those each run different queries. Um, lastly, there's this undocumented citations tab. Um, and this also um, is a way to sort of back into the, the gaps um, through citations. And you can see. Um, specimens with GenBank IDs and no loans, or specimens with citations and no loans. And again, those are going to run queries uh, to find these gaps. Um, so looking, let's see. So looking at the multiple areas of the database where these tools are stored um, brings up this uh, need to uh, this need for us to bring all of these 
tools into one centralized spot um, and really develop a more visual dashboard to summarize uh, loan statistics. Um, but these all are really helpful queries to ensure we're not missing opportunities to document specimen usage. So they're, they're um, great to periodically just query those and, and link up the data that you can. Um, next are a couple of tools for integrating derived specimen data from external digital repositories. Um, so the first is a GenBank discovery tool. So Arctos is a GenBank partner. Um, so when a researcher submits sequence data to NCBI using that Darwin Core triplet associated with the voucher, um, as Teresa mentioned, a, reciproc a reciprocal link is automatically created between the sequence record in GenBank and the sequence record in Arctos. And that just gives um, users a path to navigate directly between the metadata in either repository. Um, and she's already demonstrated this, but um, you can see the GenBank access accession number related to this um, shrew in Arctos. And then um, if you were to click this link, you'll see the associated uh, sequence record in GenBank um, with a reciprocal link back to Arctos. Um, however, when a researcher fails to include voucher source ID when submitting sequences, as we know often is the case, um, Arctos uses a discovery tool that performs automated queries on institution code in GenBank. Um, so it runs this wildcard query on institution code that generates a list of possible sequence matches relating to Arctos institutions. And then these matches can be claimed by Arctos users um, by entering the GenBank accession number on the Arctos side of things in the specimen record, um, which will then engage that autolink process. So just to demonstrate this tool, if I navigate to find low quality data, GenBank discovery tool, um, I'm just going to jump to my collection here. Um, and you can see, um, I'm UCM, you can see uh, this, this process isn't quite perfect, so uh, I have quite a few unmatched um, GenBank sequences, and that's actually because um, the, the query just performs wildcard um, searches on the acronym UCM, and in my case, I get a lot of sort of false positives because there is an institute in Spain, um, the University of Madrid, that has the same acronym, um, so I, I get a lot of matches to their sequences. Um, so those I just kind of ignore. but. Uh, or um, mammal records, which I know I can claim. Let me just click to show you. Uh, so you'll see it, it ran the, the wildcard query, and I come up with two records pointing to marmots. Um, and I can confirm that, indeed, these are my specimens. And you can sort of see where this um, Darwin Core triplet went awry. The researcher entered UCM, but then they actually specified USA Colorado ma'am, and then the catalog number. So that's why um, I wasn't automatically um, linking the GenBank sequence to the UCM record. So I can um, simply just copy and paste this accession number into the corresponding mammal record. So if I'm in my marmot mammal record. I can see actually this record has already um, been sequenced, probably at a different loci. And then um, we've got a citation relating um, to previous research. I can click on other ID, paste that integer, that uh, accession number in, and just specify that it's a GenBang sequence. Oops. Sorry, I thought I cleared that that and you'll see it's now in the record and if I refresh you'll see the accession um, is instantly available and I can go ahead and navigate to that sequence record um, and this will eventually link back to Arctos I think it's just um, sort of a cached uh, process so it might take about 24 hours or how often, however often GenBank runs that um, all right. Let's see. Okay, sorry. Um, deep linking citations, another data integration tool. Um, so this is last but not least, but we're going to talk about publication metrics. 
And um, publication metrics are extremely valuable in documenting collections usage. And there are several queries users can run to find undocumented citations. Um, so you probably noticed earlier, let's go back to um, the data dashboard, um, that when I was talking about loans, that there are, are services to find publications without authors or citations. Um, so you can see. Um, Let me just. So you can see here, I have, um, again, the, the bird specimens without a citation. I can also go to these same um, tools and then look at citations. So there's publications with, uh, without authors, publications without citations, where, again, there's just a list provided um, so that I can, in my own time, kind of go through those and um, make those links with specimen records. There's this undocumented citations tab where, again, um, there are links to queries for um, finding project publications that lack citations, project publications that lack digital object identifiers, um, et cetera. Um, but let's see. But these are um, these pub metrics basically are all integrated through persistent digital object identifiers or PubMed IDs, um, which Arctos pulls in with a finding tool, which I'll demonstrate in a minute. Um, but the DOIs are being rapidly applied to older publications, um, so the system is constantly improving. Um, Arctos uses external infrastructures um, to aid in what we call deep linking projects with research outputs. So in this process, um, Crossref links um, NSF award numbers to pub DOIs and open citations crawls the academic literature to find papers citing publications tied to Arctos specimens. Um, so deep linking captures the activity or the project funding, um, the activity that it directly supported, so collecting and publishing specimen-based research, and all the activity that activity supported, so all those secondary publications citing the primary references. So in this way, it really becomes possible to paint a multi-dimensional picture of the research impact of a cataloged item, um, which is sort of the ultimate success metric um, that really aids in conveying collection usage and benefits. Um, so if we just quickly look in Arctos at an example, um, I've pulled up a publication that shows um, links to the projects that supported this research, um, as well as all the specimens examined during the project and cited in the paper, um, with links to all the identifications made by the authors. Um, and you can see that through Crossref, we can actually instantly view um, review the papers referenced by this publication as well as all the papers that have um, subsequently been cited by the publication. And um, if, I cross, if I click on this Crossref data tab, um, that will actually bring on um, this large list. Um, so if we walk through an example, I found um, a publication in need of a, of a DOI. So you can see um, there's a little alert, no DOI, please edit and add. Um, so click this again, and Arctos will actually just do a query based on this full citation text to find um, potential matches. And um, basically, it highlights everything in green that it's, it's pretty positive um, is an exact match versus these orange highlighted citations um, are just potential matches. Maybe they share the same authors. Um, but if I read through my full citation, I can actually verify, indeed, this is the correct um, publication. I will apply a DOI, so I'll click that. Um, and that will populate here. So I'll save so that the DOI is now associated with the record. Um, and now if I go back to that original publication page and push refresh, um, you'll see now it's, um, it's got the DOI, and now it's instantly um, pulled in 
at least it doesn't look like it pulled in the references, but it did um, pull in all the secondary citation um, publications that have cited this paper. So it's pretty instantaneous um, and a really sort of compelling feature to demonstrate, um, you know, research impacts. And um, I'll also add that with, uh, you know, ORCID IDs gaining popularity, we can do the same sort of deep linking for people and organizations, not just specimens. So um, just to wrap up before we get into Q&A, um, metrics beget metrics. So as we integrate increasingly diverse data types, especially semantically linked data, we increase um, connectivity and our ability to detect gaps in this connectivity. And low quality data metrics really aid in identifying and remedying these misconnections. Um, standardized data are critical for metrics. They're, they enable um, precision when assembling all of the pieces of information that comprise the extended specimen. And from an Arctos standpoint, expressing this um, holistic view of a specimen and all of its derivatives translates to success. Um, and lastly, there's a quantity versus quality issue with metrics. And so while we have been emphasizing numbers and dashboards, which are essential for reporting purposes, it's also important to underscore data quality and connectivity as measures of success. Um, we're really endeavoring to improve, augment, and link data versus simply just making skeletal specimen records available. Um, and, when, and with robust data and tools that capture all the extended specimen products in Arctos, we're poised to best understand the use and impacts of collections and in turn maximize their benefits and demonstrate their value to stakeholders. Um, so with that, I think we will wrap things up and um, open it, it up for questions. I'll um, may enable your microphones. You can also type questions in the in the chat box, but um, if you'd like to speak, you can go ahead and do so. And Teresa, if there's anything you'd like to add, go ahead. No, I think uh, I think you covered it awesomely. Thanks. Oh yeah, and I see you linked to the extended specimen report. So um, I don't know for those of you who are at Spinach, that was all over the meeting, um, and I think an important um, paper moving forward. This concept of really um, integrating all of the derivative data um, that's generated from a specimen, um, and and finding ways to really link that up. Yeah, and I'll also say that um, inspecting these kind of links um, and the low quality data um, almost always leads, leads to improved specimen records um, where you find things that were entered incorrectly or mismatched and um, it just makes all the data so much better. Yeah, and it's a great project for uh, <laughs> your volunteers and students who are who are savvy um, in Arctos. Um, if anyone has questions, feel free to type or ask again. And I did just um, enter the little link for the survey for IDIG Bio. Um, it takes like one to two minutes. If you could just um, please fill that out. That that lets us um, use this Adobe Connect for format for um, with no costs and really gives us um, valuable feedback and um, you can suggest future webinars you'd like to see. So we'd appreciate it if you'd fill it out. All right. I don't see any last questions, so I think we'll leave it. Oh, Beth is right. typing yeah. something. <laughs> Thanks, you're welcome. Uh, you're welcome. <laughs>